One very complicated topic, which we're not going to go into fully, I'm just going to skirt this issue, is the New Testament's take on the nature of man. The Christian Bible insists that after Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, human beings became essentially full of sin and that we cannot be different. The New Testament teaches that we are under the dominion and control of Satan, of the devil. The devil rules us. We don't have the ability to really on our own live godly lives that are pleasing to God. There's nothing that we could do. We are so filthy, the Christian Bible says, so dirty, that no matter what we do, God will never really respect it. We'll never really be in relationship with God. The Christian Bible says that we're under the control of the devil. We cannot be good. There are no people on the planet that are righteous. No one can be righteous. And that human beings do not have the ability, they don't have the ability to live righteous lives. We cannot. That's the Christian assessment of human beings. By the way, it's interesting that if you ask many Christians, why did God give us the commandments of the Bible? Why did God give the Jewish people the Bible? The answer that most Protestants will give you is that God gave us the commandments to show us that we're not capable of keeping them. And they say that the whole purpose of the Torah is to act like a mirror. And when you look into the mirror, the Torah is that mirror that you look in it and you see how filthy you are because you see what a sinner you are and how you're not capable of keeping the Torah. That, from the Christian point of view, is the purpose of the Torah, and it shows us who we are. We're filthy, we're dirty. You know, most Protestants, many Protestants, have a theology that's summed up, summed up by the word tulip, T-U-L-I-P. And the word, the letter T, the first letter, stands for total depravity. They see human beings as totally depraved. We are basically miserable sinners, filthy, miserable sinners. By the way, when you tell people that every day of their life, we know what kind of an impact it's going to have on the way they live. We know in schools where teachers are told ahead of time, your class this year is a very bright class. They're good kids. The kids do very well in school. And when a teacher is told these kids are problem kids and not that smart, the same kids will not do as well. So the message that Christianity has been giving people for 2,000 years is your useless miserable, filthy sinner, and you cannot be good. It has a devastating impact on the quality of people's lives. What does the Bible say, the Jewish Bible? At the very beginning, after the sin of Adam and Eve, when you might have walked away from that story making the Christian mistake of thinking, oh, after the Garden of Eden, we've been infected by the sin of Adam and Eve, we can't be good anymore. Look what God says right away to Cain. God says to Cain, why are you angry and why are you so despondent? Surely if you improve, you'll be forgiven. Well, doesn't, know that, doesn't God know that he can't improve? Isn't God aware of the fact that Cain is just under the control of the devil and he cannot become good? Why would God say, if you can be good, if you improve? But if you do not improve yourself, sin will lay at the door. Its desire will be towards you, but you can conquer it. These are the words that God says at the very beginning of our scriptures to human beings, not just to Cain, you can overcome the temptation to sin. You're not powerless against it. And right away we're told there was a person like Noah. He was tzaddik tamim, perfectly righteous. And throughout the Bible we're told there are people who are perfectly righteous. We're told that Eov, Job, was a person that was perfect and upright. Even about someone like David, interestingly, the Bible says, you have not been like my servant David, David kept my commandments and followed after me with all of his heart to do only that was right in my eyes, God says. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of Hashem and turned not aside from anything that he commanded all the days of his life except for the matter of Uriah the Hittite. This was a mistake that David had meant, made by sending him out, Uriah the Hittite, to be killed in battle and take his wife. But we see that God is considering David to be a totally righteous person. Why? Why is God considering David to be totally righteous? Because David repented. And the Bible says, if you look at Proverbs 24, seven times the righteous person will fall and they will rise. 
but the wicked ones will stumble through evil. One thing that you see here, and this was something that you'll see throughout the Bible, the Bible is constantly contrasting the righteous to the wicked, especially in the books of Proverbs and Psalms, but throughout the rest of the Bible as well. We're not told in the Bible there are no righteous people. You cannot be righteous. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone's miserable. The whole theme of the Bible is to say there are righteous people in this world and there are wicked people in this world. And God says, I want you to be one of the righteous ones. How? By following my commandments. And if you mess up, you repent. And it's saying here in Proverbs that if you fall down and you make a mistake and you sin, but you pick yourself up and you learn from your mistakes and you grow from your mistakes, that's how you become righteous through that process of falling down and getting up. Look at the very bottom of page 9. You that love Hashem hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hands of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in Hashem, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Again, this contrast between the righteous and the wicked plays through the entire Bible. Well... There's another straw man argument. He just uh, goes through this series of straw man arguments. But what is a straw man argument? Well, it's when you build this straw man, you say, well, my opponent says this, but you are not saying what your opponent says. You are building this easy target. And you say, well, he does this, this, and this, but you, you're making your own little thing that this person does, and then you attack that. So it really isn't related to the people you're actually talking about. It's related to your little straw man that you made. And, and that's what this guy seems to do repeatedly. He makes these straw man arguments. I don't know whether he's doing it intentionally or whether he just doesn't know much about Christianity and he's just talking from a point of ignorance. I don't know. But anyway, it's another straw man argument. So let's go over some of what he was talking about. Um, now, as far as the dominion of Satan goes, um, there is a teaching in the in the New Testament that uh, does talk about a dominion of Satan and about the kingdom of darkness, which is um, it relates back to uh, other Jewish works that were kind of um, from what they were. These kind of Jewish works were kind of sidelined by the rulers of Jesus' time, uh, like the works of Enoch and perhaps some of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls show some of these works. The works of the Book of Jubilees, I think we'll go into it a bit. And it's uh, Judaism wasn't just one teaching totally defined. It was a, sort of a, a range of teachings, much like Christianity is. And the, the Dead Sea people had a, a slightly different theology than, say, the Pharisees did. And the uh, Jesus had a different theology than maybe both of them did. But he did have elements of the Dead Sea Scroll people, and he did have elements of the Essenes, um, which uh, those people carried the book of Enoch. Uh, <clears throat> the apostles, I think Peter and James, I think, uh, they both quote the book of Enoch. Um, so, and the book of Enoch very plainly talks about the fallen angels, and the kingdom of darkness and the existence of demons. Um, as you know, in the, New, in the New Testament, Jesus cast out demons many, many times. So um, just because uh, the mainstream Judaism of the day 
uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees rejected that part of Judaism. And they had uh, basically the Tanakh is from them. And it excludes some of these other books uh, that he's uh, saying that uh, Christians have followed after that wrong stuff is what he's saying without saying it because I guess he doesn't want to talk about where it comes from. But it was um, within Judaism, th these uh, different opinions and different books were uh, a part of Judaism. They just weren't the mainstream. So that's where the dominion of Satan comes from. And you will find it in the Tanakh. Um, if you look hard enough, it's in there. But I think um, trying to strip that away was probably um, a part of why they selected those books above other books like, for example, the Book of Enoch. Uh, but Jesus included those things. Okay, so now what he talks about the Protestants. I don't know why he doesn't say anything about Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox, but he talks about Protestants. And then he uses the acronym TULIP to go after Protestants. Um, now, TULIP is from Calvinism. It's uh, the teachings of John Calvin summarized in the acronym TULIP. And it's um, today about 7% of Protestants are Calvinist. Um, from just from a quick look up on Google to see like how prevalent is Calvinism today. Uh, they say about 7% of Protestantism. And uh, Calvinism has been sort of left behind by Christianity because it is, uh, it does not, it's, it's a predestination saying that uh, certain people are saved and they are chosen by God. There's nothing you can do about it. And uh, you're either one of the elect or you're not. It's not up to you. And God chooses you out of the crowd and you can't even stop it. That's basically predestination th theology. And um, this is what he's talking about with Tulip. Um, so, you know, that's sort of been left behind by Christianity. Jesus said, uh, you know, many are, many are called, few are chosen. Um, he, he sends his invitation out to everybody, not to only a few. And it's... He sends it out to everybody, but only a few respond in a positive way. So he's looking for those who accept his invitation. And, you know, this is what most Christian, Protestant Christians believe. Um, and as far as being in total depravity, as he says, like your teacher is telling you, you're in total depravity. This is so bad for the children. Well, maybe in a situation like in the residential schools of Canada for the native people, and I went to a Roman Catholic school, and it was kind of like that until they got rid of the nuns and put teachers in. Um, it was like that. Uh, it was like they hated you and you had to be so careful about everything you did or else they would come after you. It was like that feeling. Um, but that's not really what Protestantism is like today. That's kind of ridiculous to say that. So Protestantism Sunday school is uh, the children are actually celebrated as children of Jesus. You know, it, it's it's a very positive 
atmosphere. So what he's talking about with a total depravity is, is really not the case. Um, now the world is in total depravity. That is very much a teaching of both Judaism and Christianity. The, the world at large is depraved. And um, <clears throat> I'll look at this book of Jeremiah, chapter 13, as an example. Uh, verse, uh, starting in verse 22. And if thou say in thy heart, Why has these things come upon me? For the greatness of your iniquities are your skirts discovered, and your heels made bare. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? But then you also can do good that are accustomed to do evil. So what does that mean? It means that those who are accustomed to evil, it's very, very difficult to change your ways. Um, you know, growing up in, the, in a, a home that has a lot of problems, dysfunctions, like alcoholism, drugs, uh, anger, other kinds of dysfunctions. When you grow up in a situation like that and are accustomed to it, uh, chances are that uh, you will carry on some of those dysfunctions in your own life. And it's very difficult to shake those things. Even after repenting and even after becoming a Christian, you still have a struggle to shake those things. But at least you want to shake them, is the good news. Um, now God says after that in Jeremiah, uh, therefore I will scatter them as the stubble that passes away by the wind of the wilderness. So, you know, even in that situation, it's even more difficult to shake things. Now, the message of the gospel is repentance, just as the rabbi was talking about. If you repent, then you can keep the law. You can get back to God's ways if you repent. But if you don't repent, then it's further and further down the hole you go. So that's still the same thing in Christianity. Uh, but Jesus offers a path and a way to be cleansed and start fresh. He offers you a second chance, the chance to, okay, you can be straight without working your way up there to get to God. You can come to God immediately and be washed clean. And of course, you know, you, you're going to have some old habits and you're going to have some problems to overcome, but he's going to be there with you to help you overcome them. So this is when you give your life to Jesus. This is the process that you enter into. So that's what real Christianity is about. It's about repenting and coming back to God with God's help to do that. Um, uh, I can't speak too much about J Judaism, about uh, how they view that thing about someone coming back and what it takes to get back to uh, God's kingdom when after you have left or maybe your family left a few generations ago there's some process that they have set up to bring that back uh, with Christians they Christians have their process that is taught by Jesus so that's the reality. Like he he's bringing up Calvinism. That's like Puritans. He's talking about the Puritans, and saying, "Well, they're doing it wrong." Well, yeah, that was four hundred years ago. Um, duh. Like, what is he talking about? Um, so again, another straw man argument. So, and he says, "Oh." 
Christians look at it like a mirror. And if you look in the mirror at the law, then you see how bad you are and how you cannot. Uh, he's, he's referring to James, the book of James. I'll find it very quickly. Jude, John, Peter, James. The light on. James chapter 1, okay, verse 22. But be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man, beholding his natural face in a glass, looking in a mirror, and he beholds himself, and goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. So he looks in the mirror, and sees himself for what he is, and instead of repenting, as the rabbi talked about repenting, same thing, Instead of repenting, he just goes on with his life. He's not a doer of the word. He's only He only heard it, didn't do it. So that's what that is about. Like he, he, the rabbi, again, uses the straw man argument and turns it into something that it's not. And then he attacks the thing that it's not. Um, so, you know, it's kind of hard to answer that stuff without laughing about it because it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, I wish he would come up with a real argument for once. Uh, he, but he, he doesn't seem to know anything about Christians. So he's talking out of ignorance, I guess. Um, anyway, it's, you know, there's a lot of theology that could come into all of this, talking about uh, being in a world that is depraved and sinful. Like Cain, Cain sinned once. It was right after his one sin. So this is not a person accustomed to sin. So God is saying, if you repent, you can get back in the good books and, and everything will be okay. And that's true. But did Cain repent? No, he didn't. He, he went off and into exile and did his thing. So, um, God, the opportunity was there, but he didn't take it. So why didn't he take it? Because he was a murderer. Like, why did he murder in the first place? Like, you know, those are theological questions. So, um, a person that has grown up in a sinful, depraved environment is, you know, they could turn around immediately. It's, it's happened, and, and it happens from time to time, but my own experience, it wasn't immediate. It was immediate, and then it turned, I fell back into my old ways, and then had to say, what am I doing, and repent again, and maybe more than once do that. Um, and it was a bit of a struggle, because it's just not my nature to be uh, Christ-like, you know. And the more I cling to Christ and cling to his teachings, the more I absorb that. So that was my experience, but I, I would have no doubt that some people have had a completely different experience. Um, the way Christ operates in someone's life. So, you know, there's a lot of weird questions that will come up about that. Like, what about the people who never heard of Jesus? Well, I could teach in from the Bible, from the letters of Paul, that uh, a person can be a follower of Jesus without even knowing it, or without even ever, without ever hearing about it. But he is a law unto himself. So a person could um, 
unknowingly follow the principles of Christ. And um, people before Jesus was born. Well, Jesus existed before he was born. So the righteous ones were following the principles of Christ. If you look at ancient Israel, uh, there was good ones and there was bad ones. So we're talking about, okay, Jews or all Israelites, but let's just say Jews, it makes it simpler for today. There was good Jews and there was bad Jews. There was people who were uh, con completely condemned by God and they were Jews. And then there was people who were called righteous and people who followed God and they were Jews. So it's not about whether you're a Jew or not. It's about whether you follow God or not. And it's the same thing with Christians. It's not about what you call yourself or what you claim to be. It's what you are that matters. So, you know, that's when you want to talk about real theology and real uh, questions, then those are the kinds of things that you talk about. Not this, uh, you know, hammering away at a 400-year-old theology that is still held by a minority. It's like, what, what, what is he trying to get at here? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know, but um, that's what that is. Now, uh, starting in the next video, he starts to change gears into other arguments. So maybe we'll get away from this continually attacking different uh, forms of the straw man talking about what Protestants are. It's kind of like, you know, the, he doesn't even know what a Protestant is. So we'll see you next week. Thank you. Oh, and could you uh, like and subscribe the video? Um, it helps with my algorithm, algorithms and uh, helps bring the channel up a little bit. Thank you very much.